All right. I thought I'd throw up a little bit of current events here. Um, this just came out. This is a, well, this actually didn't just come out. This little larva, sea organism, uh, has been known about for like 180 years. They, you know, marine biologists like catch big fish or dolphins or something, and they open up their guts and they just look to see what they've been eating. That's so like how, you know, big fish just kind of concentrate the ocean right into their guts. So instead of having to go find tiny little larvae, you know, you can just see them right there. So this guy was named uh, Ceratepus monstrosa. Uh, because it's this large, monstrous-looking larva. And we've known about it for a long time, but we never knew what it actually turned into as an adult, because we've only found it dead in the guts of fish. Um, they recently, just this month, found out through genetic, uh, genetic sequencing and comparisons that this larva actually turns into this deep-sea shrimp species. So this like, age-old mystery of what the, the monstrosa uh, larva turns into, it turns into this guy. Which actually is a big surprise, because other shrimp don't have a larva that looks anything like that. It's actually a much more shrimp-looking thing. And so it was a big mystery that's just been solved by genetics. So uh, kind of fun. If you want to read about it, ecology and evolution just this month. So all right, what we're doing today, we're going to do the history of genetics today. So like I said before, there's kind of two philosophies on how to teach genetics, either the chronological approach, where we just go like historically through what was discovered first, and so you start with Mendel, basically. Um, I like a molecular approach better, so we're actually going to start um, talking about the structure of DNA, structure of nucleotides, cell division, so we'll go through mitosis and meiosis again, just to remind you. And then we'll actually use what we know about DNA and cell biology to actually use that to, to say, why are Mendel's laws true? Why is uh, the traditional laws of heredity hold true? Um, so we'll, we'll do the history of genetics, though, because I like to kind of give you an overview of when these things were happening and give you a kind of a broad overview of the chronology. But then we'll, when we actually get into the meat of the subject, we'll start with, with molecular biology. Then we'll go into the central dogma. And if we have time, we'll, we might start talking about nucleotide structure and start doing some organic chemistry, which I'm sure you're all looking forward to. All right, so the history of genetics. Um, people have been thinking about how traits are inherited for centuries. I mean, I, I, I think that maybe even Adam and Eve, when they had Cain and Abel, said, oh, they kind of look like us, but kind of don't look like us. And you know, people have been raising livestock and breeding pets and doing all kinds of stuff and thinking about how traits are inherited for centuries. And there's lots of interesting theories that were out. I mean, the Greeks, like always, had something interesting to say about everything. So there's Greek views of inheritance. Uh, there's you know, views that were going through the Middle Ages about, uh, about how things were transferred. Uh, I'm going to start our discussion talking with good old Charles Darwin here, um, because he was the first to have a real, um, maybe, maybe the most popular view. And he had a mechanism to his view, which kind of separated out from all the other just kind of general philosophies. Like, well, I think traits are inherited this way. He actually proposed a mechanism, which is interesting. This, um, you know, Darwin was right on the cusp there of the scientific revolution where we started doing like real experimental biology um, with kind of a naturalistic and materialistic viewpoint. So mechanism was everything, right? Can we map it onto some mathematical formula? So Darwin had a view. Uh, he called his view of heredity pangenesis. And I say he had a view of heredity um, because the term genetics wasn't around yet. People were just looking for the laws of heredity. Um, and you can see in his theory, he kind of introduces this genesis. So uh, pan meaning all, all-encompassing, genesis meaning the beginning of. So what is the beginning of all the traits that we see? What's the fundamental thing about those? Um, and Darwin wrote a book. He wrote many books. We know him most for Origin of the Species. Maybe some people know or have read The Descent of Man. But he actually wrote several other books. And one of them was called The Variation of Animals and plants under domestication. Uh, Darwin was a wealthy, upper-class Englishman. He didn't have to make a living. He inherited money from his family. And so, as a lot of other British noblemen, he just took up hobbies. And his hobby was being a naturalist, so he went out on the Beagle and just you know, was the naturalist on the ship and collected all kinds of species. And then he also bred pigeons, like a lot of gentlemen did. And so he just basically built a catalog of all the different variations that he could find. 
So people breeding pigeons, people breeding dogs, people breeding um, you know, crops, uh, livestock. And he just put together a big catalog of all these variations and started proposing how these variations were inherited over time. So he proposed his pangenesis theory here in 1868. And the kind of things he was looking at, here is the common rock pigeon. You guys have seen these all you know, flying around the dump or down at the seashore. Uh, this one's unique because it actually has both of its legs. Have you, ever, like, uh, ever noticed that down at the ocean, like they're always just hopping around and they got a little stump on the other one? Um, that's not an inheritable trait. You know, they're getting caught in fishing line or whatever and, and losing a leg. But um, this is the common rock pigeon. You probably have all seen it. And fancy English gentlemen bred these for interesting traits. It was kind of their hobby. So if you take two common rock pigeons, male and female, just like this, and you breed them over and over again, you start getting subtle variations showing up. And so some of these variations are like this. Here's one, it's all black. And it's got a really profuse um, operculum. I had to look up the definition of that. that. That bunchy cartilaginous thing on top of its nostrils is the operculum. So that one's really kind of big and elaborate. Um, here's a different variety really elaborate tail feathers, big blue feathers, all white feathers. It actually has a lot of and very big chest feathers, and then it's also kind of strutting, which is why its neck is so back and forth. You can get even different color varieties as well. This one's got brown, spot, or, uh, you know, brown wings, white spots. You've lost any of the barring here. Here's a cool one. <laughs> This one has wing feathers growing out of its legs. So typically, the cells in the legs don't make, don't make feathers. They make scales. Well, here, the scales, instead of becoming scales, have turned into not only down feathers. There's some that have fluffy down feathers on them. This one actually is making wing feathers on them. So Darwin just categorized all of these. And it's, I haven't looked through the book, but it's got all kinds of stuff like this in it. So he is, as well as being kind of a catalog for all of these, he proposed his theory of inheritance. And his main thesis, this is what you, you really need to know about, about it, so the, the name of his theory. But his, his philosophy was that traits were blended over generations, that you get subtly different phenotypes. Right? You start out with this rock pigeon, and you get two of them. Most likely, when they breed, their offspring are going to look almost like them. But you get subtly different changes. And if you keep selecting for those subtle different changes, they can get to become pretty robustly uh, obvious, uh, large changes. So his, his theory is that traits blend over time. Um, this isn't new, but what is new about Darwin's theory is that he actually proposed this mechanism for it. He actually had a unit of inheritance, and he called it a gemule. And a gemule is a purely philosophical thing. He didn't know what it was. There was no experimental data that said a thing like this exists. It was just kind of a, a hypothesis. And he said that these gemules um, were the units of heredity, so they're passed down from multiple generations. And he said that they were located in the somatic cells, that is, the cells of the entire body. Right? And that there were all kinds of gemules for each individual characteristic or trait. So for wings, there were wing gemules. And for coloration, there were color gemules. And for beak size, there were beak size gemules. And they all had some specified information for what the, what the trait should be. And so his mechanism is these uh, gemules get released from all the somatic cells. So the wing gemules and all those things are circulating around in the organism's body, being released from all the cells. And they get concentrated down into the gonads and into the actual genetic material, the eggs or the sperm. So as the organism is developing, it develops based on the gemules it has. And then whatever gemules it has, it concentrates into its gonads and passes them down. Um, it's kind of a numbers game with this mechanism. Right? It depends on how many gemules you got. Right? So the more black colored gemules you have, the blacker you will be. The more green gemules you have, the greener you will be. So it's a, a blending, a ratios. Right? If you've got 50-50 you know, white and black gemules, then you're going to be a gray. Right? So um, 
people actually started hunting for the gemmules. They looked for something in the blood. Um, they couldn't find anything. Um, but this idea kind of took off, because at least it had some type of mathematical formula that you could put to it, right? trying to get at a mechanism. Now, notice the date. This was 1868 that he published all these results in his book. We all know Gregor Mendel. He was actually born Johann Mendel, but when he entered the Augustinian monastery, he took on the name Gregor. So that's how we know him now. Um, Gregor is a contemporary of Darwin, was around at the same time. He was a, educated at Vienna, in the University of Vienna. Then he entered the monastery. And he actually became an instructor. He instructed, I don't know, the village people, other, uh, other monks in physics, in, in biology. It was kind of all natural philosophy or natural physics at the time. He was a naturalist in the sense of, not that he had a naturalistic worldview. I mean, he was a committed theist. He was an Augustinian monk. Um, but he just enjoyed nature, enjoyed studying about, about the world. He did his famous pea plant experiments. Notice the dates. It's overlapping here with Darwin. 1856 to 1867. Darwin's book came out in 1868. Okay, so right about the same time, they're proposing different mechanisms for heredity. <clears throat> he postulated his laws of heredity. And again, it was a mechanism like Darwin's. And he wrote these all up in a paper. I don't know what journal it was published in, but it was uh, called Experiments in Plant Hybridization. And he wrote up all his results about the traits of the pea plants um, differing from each other. Um, Darwin's theory caught on. And pangenesis was actually the, you know, the genetic theory to, to adopt at the time, even though Mendel published his results in 65, you know, three years earlier than, Mendel, or than, than Darwin did. Um, his didn't catch on, though, because, well, two reasons. Darwin was already kind of starting to get famous. Um, Mendel was a monk. Mendel was in like Austria, which is, I guess, part of Austria is now Czechoslovakia. Uh, Darwin's in England. And Mendel wrote his in German. <laughs> Darwin wrote his in English. And there's not a lot of good communication. You know, there's no internet or big publishing companies. So it's, it's hard to transfer information at this time. Um, so the other thing that, that kept Mendel's laws from getting uh, widely accepted is that he did these in pea plants, and he had a very good mechanism, right? It's the, it's the true mechanism of how things are inherited. And he tried to then confirm it in some other species. So he started off in pea plants. He got all these laws of heredity. And then he picked another plant model and started trying to rep replicate his results. And he could not replicate his results. The numbers didn't match at all. Uh, unfortunately for Mendel, he picked an organism that actually has an asexual reproductive cycle that he didn't know was going on. So there was like sexual, and then you could have a sexual cycle in the middle, and then go back to a sexual cycle, and then do asexual. So he was getting all these wacky numbers that didn't make sense. Uh, he tried to do this in bees as well, because beekeeping was a big thing. Um, but bees, unfortunately, the female can mate with multiple different males and carry sperm from multiple different males. And so you never know which, pure, which breeding is going on. Uh, the same is for flies, and so that's going to create some problems for us in our genetics lab, actually, making sure we know who the female mated with. She can mate with five different males, have five different sperm, and you never know what you know, the results are, you know, what the, the cross actually was. So he died. Well, actually, he, he didn't die just yet. Um, in 67, he got promoted. He was the, uh, the abbot of the, uh, of the monastery. So he didn't have time for his pea plant experiments. He had to deal with all the administrative stuff of running the abbey. So he stopped his pea plant experiments, stopped trying to do it, published his results. And he just basically thought, well, I've just discovered something kind of novel in pea plants, and it's not applicable to anything else. So it just kind of got buried. And only a couple people in the plant breeding community really knew about, about his results. Um, the bummer is, so he, he was the abbey of his monastery. And then when he died and the new guy took over, apparently there was like tax issues or whatever, and there's big controversy. So he just went in and took all Mendel's papers and burned them all. He's like, we're just going to get a fresh start on everything here. Uh, so I don't think there's actually any extant copies or, or uh, 
writings that, that Mendel actually did. Now, we still have copies of the paper that he published, but we don't actually have any of his papers. There's even, there's even a little bit of a controversy about, about his experiment. Um, people have copied identical experiments that he did, and they don't get numbers nearly as neat and tidy as Mendel got. Like his three to one ratio was just like right on in, his, in the numbers that he published. And when people have repeated it, it doesn't quite come out as nicely. So people have accused him of like, you know, monkeying with the data to make it look better than it is. But we don't have any of his original notebooks, so we, we don't know. So for about 50 years, Darwin's theory was the predominant one. This blending and this gemmule theory, and people were bouncing other ones around, but no one really knew what was going on with Mendel's work. It wasn't until about 1900 that a group of plant biologists found Mendel's old papers, repeated them in a plant model that didn't go through the asexual cycle, and found, lo and behold, Mendel's laws held true. And then more people started thinking, oh, these are good laws. They seem to be working, and lots and lots of other confirmation happened in lots of other organisms. And one of the prime players at this time is this guy named William Bateson. And I call Bateson the greatest geneticist you've never heard of. Has anybody heard of Bateson? You have? Oh, from, your... from my gen bio lecture, yeah. <laughs> I'm like the Bateson uh, evangelist. Um, <laughs> He wrote a book, um, Materials for the Study of Variation. It was a lot like Mendel's, or I'm sorry, a lot like Darwin's book. It's a catalog of all these variations. Um, he's around 1900s when he's doing his work. Um, so 1894 is when his, his paper came out. These are the kind of variations he was looking at. This is, um, this is a fruit fly. Um, Bateson originally saw this in bees, but a lot of insects have this phenomenon. Here's a normal fly. And here are the little antenna coming out of its head right between its eyes. Uh, there's naturally occurring mutations just occasionally in nature when you're breeding bees or breeding flies. You see those antenna, instead of becoming these little stumpy antenna, actually becoming long, fully formed legs. Uh, so these are all kinds of wacky mutations that he was collecting too. And you know, more and more people are doing experiments here. He was also interested in polydactyly. Uh, the, the additional fingers. So here's split thumbs here. Uh, here's an extra pinky. So he's thinking along Darwin's lines as well about all these variations and how can we explain them. And it was Bateson that's really, he's the greatest geneticist um, you never heard of, not because he came through with any groundbreaking experiments of his own, but he really was key in popularizing Mendel's laws. So he actually founded well, one of the things he did do, he co-discovered <laughs> linkage, the idea of two traits going together at the same time. Like in human populations, uh, light hair and light eyes tend to go together, right? That's the idea of linkage. So he co-discovered that with Punnett, Reginald Punnett. Mm -hmm. And Punnett's popular because everybody knows the Punnett square, right? But there's no Bateson square equivalent, so. He, what he did do is he founded the Journal of Genetics. And he's the one that actually coined the term genetics. So he took Darwin's pangenesis term and then applied it to Mendel's laws, and he called this new formulation genetics. He coined a bunch of other terms that we still use, like gene and genetic and allele and epistasis, the idea of two traits um, interacting with each other. So he was a very big uh, proponent of just making this a popular view. So this is early 1900s. We're going to skip because we're just doing highlights of the history of genetics. Um, actually, let's stop and take questions. Do you guys have questions about Mendel, Darwin, or new popularization here? Was Bateson German or English? Bateson was English, okay. yeah. yeah. Oh, when was Origin of the Species? 18... You said 200 years. Like 18... Yeah, 1850? After the catalog. After that catalog? Animals, because yeah. Because he references a lot of that stuff. Yeah, I don't know when they were actually published. He was doing a lot of this stuff at the same time. It's like 1850s, 1860s. I was just wondering so. if it was after or that he came up with those ideas. Yeah, it was kind of at the same time. Yeah. yeah. And for him, they were, they were 
inextricably linked, right? I mean, his idea is natural selection occurring over multiple generations, so new traits have to be inherited for them to be selected upon, so they kind of go hand in hand, yeah. Unfortunately, his theory was false, so we had to make peace with natural selection and, uh, and Mendel's laws, which actually is called neo-Darwinism, or the modern synthesis that goes by a bunch of names. We might talk about that more. All right, the next big guy that I want to talk about is Thomas Hunt Morgan. Uh, Morgan was in the 1930s uh, at Columbia University. Um, this is Morgan here. This is one of his students uh, after his student actually started his own lab and became an old man. But I put up this picture because uh, Morgan and Strutrevant and, uh, and a lot of Morgan's uh, other students spent lots and lots of time just sitting in rooms with vials and vials of Drosophila, of little fruit flies, and breeding them for different traits and watching the inheritance of them. One of the traits that Morgan is really famous for, uh, and this is, uh, Morgan's kind of pinnacle because Mendel had laws that worked, right? His laws of inheritance work and they can predict phenotypes in the next generation. Um, Morgan took the laws and actually applied them to chromosomes. Now in the 20s, 30s is when we're first starting to figure out that it's DNA that seems to be the inherited molecule. Uh, people didn't know that for a long time. So what Morgan saw is he saw sex-linked mutations. So we already knew about linkage. Some traits go together. We started thinking DNA is the actual inheritance molecule. And in fruit flies, you can actually look at the chromosomes of the fruit fly. And you can predict sex of the, of the fruit fly based on either the X or the Y chromosome. And at this point, um, microscopy was getting better. We're making better lenses. We're actually looking inside cells. And so he could take a male and a female, look inside the cells, and he could see one has an X chromosome, the other has a Y chromosome. So he knows that sex is determined by which chromosome you inherit. And then he did these experiments, and one of them was with this mutation. Now, normally, Drosophila fruit flies have red eyes. If you just go pick one out of the wild, it's probably going to have red eyes. If you breed it over long periods of time in captivity, you start to see one of these variations, the white-eyed phenotype, loses all the pigments in the, in the eye. This actually is linked to what sex the fly is. The fly mutation for white eyes is actually on one of the sex chromosomes, and so he could then predict is this, by looking at the chromosomes, he can tell you what is the, is it going to be male or female? Is it going to have white eyes or is it going to have red eyes? That was a huge breakthrough to actually map traits onto chromosomes. So he discovered the sex-linked mutations, postulated that genes are located on the chromosomes. And then sometimes it wouldn't go as he predicted. He would expect by which chromosome it had to, to either be white or red eyes but sometimes it would vary, very occasionally. So he's the first one that postulated that maybe chromosomes aren't static, that maybe chromosomes actually break off and recombine. So he was the first to postulate crossing over of chromosomes and trading of genetic information from one chromosome to the other. We'll talk a lot about Morgan. We'll do these kind of uh, homework problems of linkage and stuff. but. Uh, he really brought the fruit fly on the map as like the ideal genetic organism as well. Now, this is the 1930s. There was lots of interesting things going on in the 20s, 30s, 40s, 50s. People were doing different model organisms, learning all kinds of things about how traits are inherited. But the next big breakthrough came with Watson and Crick. And Watson and Crick are the ones that actually proposed a model for DNA. <laughs> Watson and Crick did vanishingly little experiments. They actually didn't really even produce much data of their own. They kind of like took other people's data, and there's actually some controversy about whether or not they ethically used some other people's data. There's like in, um, so this is why I put up the book, uh, The Double Helix, this is written by James Watson, and he, this is he, where he documents um, the, the finding of the structure of DNA. Um, there's a woman named Rosalind Franklin who actually did a lot of X-ray crystallography. So she crystallized chromosomes, DNA molecules, and shot them with an X-ray and got these diffraction patterns, basically like shooting light through a, uh, a prism. Uh, 
and it makes you all the different colors of the spectrum. They would shoot x-rays at molecules that were crystallized and they would give a spectrum. And from that you could try and see what the shape of the thing that you were looking at was. They actually looked at Franklin's data and then postulated their own uh, structure that they thought had to be the case to make that scatter plot. Um, it's a really interesting book, The Double Helix. It kind of gives you an inside view of like how science is really done, you know, with the people and the cheating and the controversies and the, uh, and the competitions and stuff. It's a, it's a really fascinating book. But in 53, they proposed their structure um, and later was actually confirmed, yes, that's actually the case. And this totally revolutionized how we do genetics as well because this introduced now molecular genetics. Genetics actually at the molecular level, at the atomic level, being able to manipulate and, uh, and modify DNA. Lots of interesting things happened after that too. Lots of bacterial genetics, lots of worm genetics that's going on in the 50s, 60s. In the 70s, the next big breakthrough was cloning. And I don't mean cloning like cloning an organism. I'm talking about cloning a gene actually removing genetic material from one organism and sticking it into the genetic material of another organism. This was done by two guys. Um, Stanley Cohen was a uh, microbiologist and he was looking at how bacteria conjugate and, and trade genetic information between each other. So he was a microbiologist. Uh, Herbert Boyer was a biochemist. And he was working with proteins that actually cut and chew away at DNA called restriction endonucleases or restriction enzymes, and they cut DNA at certain locations. So he was isolating nucleic acid and cutting them with these enzymes. The two of them got together and said, what if we cut some DNA from a frog and cut some DNA from a bacteria and mixed it back together? And then Cohen, since he knew how bacteria exchanged genetic information, he said, I could reintroduce that new piece of DNA into a bacteria and see what it does. So this is in 72 was the first cloned gene, or, or first cloned, um, I guess, recombinant DNA piece. I don't, it wasn't a fully functional gene, but they got frog DNA to actually be copied and made into a, in a bacteria. Um, this is a huge breakthrough, uh, because what Boyer did was he started a, a biotech company uh, called Genentech. Genentech's still around. Um, they were the first one to make uh, synthetic uh, insulin. If you were diabetic in the pre-70s, if you were diabetic and you needed insulin, the only way to get insulin was either from a uh, cadaver and you would take out the pancreas and you'd grind up the pancreas and extract out as much insulin as you could from those cells. At a very short supply, bodies are very expensive, you know. Uh, so the alternative then is to use bovine or porcine, so a cow or pig but people have allergic reactions to cow and pig enzymes, and so that sometimes made your condition worse. So instead of curing your, um, instead of curing your diabetes or treating your diabetes, now you've just elicited an immune response, and so you've got autoimmune disease and stuff. Uh, so bad deal if you had uh, diabetes back then. Well, what Boyer did is took the human insulin gene, used his restriction enzymes to cut it out, put it into a bacteria, and now you can grow vats and vats of bacteria that make the human version of the insulin gene. Um, this is very, very profitable to, <laughs> to make recombinant human genes. So Genentech was a huge, like the first real biotech company. So I think this was around 75 or so that Genentech was formed and started getting this product out on the market. So this totally revolutionized the field of genetics. And now instead of just studying inheritance patterns, we're actually manipulating DNA and treating diseases. Right? Questions about this? I know it's just a bunch of stories. There'll probably be more, more time for interaction. But I think this stuff is interesting. It gives you, I think, a good survey of kind of where we're going in the course as well. So uh, three, more, three more landmarks. The next landmark was actually sequencing DNA. Uh, Boyer. And, and Cohen were isolating regions of chromosomes that they knew contained the coding gene that codes for that trait. Um, it wasn't until 75, though, that we actually could know at the base pair accuracy what the actual sequence of the DNA was. 
And in the early, in mid-70s here, there were two competing methods. Uh, one was by this guy named uh, Walter Gilbert, and I forget Maxim's first name. This is Walter Gilbert. Uh, they kind of had a cumbersome method of sequencing DNA. It worked, but it kind of was a lot of effort. Uh, Fred Sanger is a, uh, a British geneticist. Um, Sanger was, was amazing. Uh, he came up with a, uh, a method for sequencing DNA that was much easier, much more straightforward, uh, really took hold. So only for a couple of years were they kind of competing and then Sanger method. His Sanger method's still done. We'll do it this semester. Um, but Fred Sanger not only discovered um, a mechanism for sequencing DNA, he also discovered a mechanism actually earlier in the 50s for sequencing uh, proteins, for sequencing amino acids. So he's one of the few people in the world, actually I think the only one still alive, that actually has won two Nobel Prizes. A Nobel Prize for sequencing proteins and for sequencing DNA. Um, he's still alive. He was born in like 1918, so he's like, you know, wow. what is that, close to 100 years old, right? 90 something years old. Um, he's still alive. I don't think he's doing science anymore, but a, an amazing guy. Uh, Wally Gilbert started, um, what was the name of his? company. Genentech was Biogen, I think. They were also trying to do similar things like get the human insulin gene and treat other human diseases. Um, I don't think Biogen's around anymore, but that was one of the first biotechs too. So now in the 70s, we're starting the era of, of molecular biology, genomes, and the next big revolution was the advent of PCR. Uh, PCR was invented by this guy named Kerry Mullis. He was a PhD in biochemistry. He was working for a company called the Cetus Corporation in the mid, late 70s, early 80s. And what, uh, uh, what Mullis was doing was actually making pieces of synthetic DNA. So you could, you could uh, obtain nucleotides, the, you know, the actual bases of DNA, and he was using biochemistry to string them together in specific sequences. So he's trying to do synthetic DNA, so he's making them. Um, that's really hard chemistry to do. Um, it was really labor intensive. Um, and so he's known for, so this is the book he read. He won the Nobel Prize for, for developing PCR, and if you win a Nobel Prize, people buy your book. So he, he wrote an autobiography. He's really famous for taking LSD and then like going out in the woods of Santa Cruz and having weird trips. Um, and like apparently in his book he talks about like some glowing fluorescent green raccoon talking to him and meeting with aliens and he's, he's a bizarre guy to not the typical guy you think of when you think of Nobel Prize winner but um, he said on one of these long drives out to go uh, camping in the Santa Cruz mountains he thought I'm trying to laboriously put nucleotides together one at a time using chemistry and a cell does this by itself really very quickly so why don't I just hijack the cells machinery and have the cell's own enzymes do this for me. So he developed the idea of PCR, of making little primers and then using actual enzymes from living cells to actually make you the DNA sequence that you want. Uh, this totally revolutionized cloning because now you don't have to, well, it, it's much easier to go in and get exactly the right sequence that you want. Um, you don't have the cumbersome thing of like chopping up chromosomes. Um, you can actually go in and specifically target what region of the chromosome you want to make a copy of. So PCR totally revolutionized biotech, um, and people have made hundreds of millions of dollars off of PCR. Um, Kerry Mullis got like a $10,000 bonus from Cetus Corporation, and the company owned his technology. And I think it's been sold a couple of times, but um, he didn't make a lot of money off of <laughs> something that makes people a lot of money now. Um, he still like has speaking engagements and stuff, and says weird things like, HIV doesn't cause AIDS, and he, he's, he's still an eccentric character. Um, with PCR and sequencing brought in the age of genomes, why don't we sequence the entire DNA of, an, of a complete organism? Um, the two big guys in this were Craig Venter and Francis Collins. Um, this is in the late 90s, uh, approaching 2000, when the uh, the U.S. government, in association with a couple of different governments, the Japanese government, some Germans, the English, and they did the International Human Genome Consortium. And the, the idea was we're going to sequence every nucleotide in the human genome, right? human genome project. Uh, this guy, Francis Collins, was, was the director of the U.S. 
version of it. So the Human Genome Project in the US was directed by Francis Collins. Um, this guy named Craig Venter said, the government's paying a lot of money for this. I'm going to do it privately. So he started a corporation called Celera, and he got investors, and he said, I'm going to sequence the human genome before the government does, and I'm going to patent it, the information, and we're going to make boatloads of money selling off the information to all these medical research institutions that want to know about the human genome. So he's a, as an entrepreneur. Um, and he said, we're going to beat the government, even though there's you know, labs working on this all over the, the world, uh, we're going to do it quicker because we're going to, instead of sequencing one chromosome at a time, and that's what uh, the Human Genome Project was doing. They took all the chromosomes, and they actually broke them up into the two arms of the chromosomes, and they sent each lab like one arm of the chromosome. Said, you sequence that, you sequence this. So everybody's doing a different piece. Um, Venter said, that's too laborious. Why don't we just take the entire genome, we'll just cut it up into tiny little bits, and we'll sequence it all at one time. And he, he was counting on the fact, he said, we'll just write computer programs that could take those pieces and stitch them back together. So we'll just make overlapping pieces, we'll sequence the overlaps, and then we'll just stitch it back together, and we'll have it really quick. Um, which was a, a novel idea. It's called shotgun <laughs> sequencing, <laughs> uh, because he just blew apart the whole genome into tiny fragments and then sequenced them all individually. Uh, the problem came, though, is he did. He sequenced the entire genome first, but he couldn't put it back together <laughs> because the computer programs wouldn't do it. There's too much repetitive DNA. You didn't know which pieces stuck together. So he was kind of stuck. The Human Genome Project knew where all the pieces went because they've been doing it systematically on the chromosomes, but they didn't have all the sequence. So what they decided was, well, at, at that point, I think Venter realized, I'm not going to be able to do and fulfill my promise, so I better just collaborate. So they collaborated, and Venter gave the Human Genome Project all the sequence, and they actually stitched it together on the chromosomes where they knew where it went. And as a compromise, they published the, the draft of the human genome in two separate papers at the exact same time. One was, one was in Nature, and Venter's group was the authors, and one was in Science, and, uh, and Colin's group was on that one. And so they published, co-published the human genome in 2001. Uh, I remember this really distinctly. That was my first year in grad school, and like everybody had a map of the human genome in the hallways. Like every floor you went on, that, you know, one of those posters from those two papers was out. Um, Collins is an interesting guy. He wrote a book called The Language of God. Uh, he's an evangelical Christian, um, and he's now the director of the NIH. So when President Obama took over, uh, he put Collins in charge of the old NIH, Nas National Institute of Health. So probably the most powerful scientist in the world to, in terms of like deciding where the most amount of dollars go for, for uh, biology research. So he's a big deal. He's a theistic evolutionist, and I disagree with him on that, but, uh, but go, go evangelicals in, in important places. Um, we're kind of entering the post-genome era. Actually, we, we really are in the post-genome era. Um, we've got better sequencing technology than when this was going on, um, and we'll talk about uh, next generation, second generation sequencing. But we can sequence genomes very cheaply and very quickly now. And a lot of genomes are out there. I mean, there's probably approaching hundreds of genomes now. Um, corn, tomato, rice, human, every model organism that you want is all sequenced now. If you have a favorite organism and you can convince the government to give you a couple of million dollars, you could sequence your organism's genome. Um, it's, it's getting very, uh, very easy to do right now. So instead of doing genome analysis, we, we're moving into post-genomics. And the post-genomic era is concentrated on a bunch of things. Well, so I guess it's not concentrated, but it is involving a bunch of things. Um, personal genomes. There's actually companies now. You can just swab the inside of your mouth, stick it in a plastic bag, send it off in an envelope, and they will do a not, a, not an entire genome analysis, but they will sequence a bunch of different regions of your genome uh, and tell you what alleles you're carrying for certain traits. Uh, they'll tell you something about your ancestry and something about, you know, risk for coronary heart disease based on other people with gene alleles similar to yours. So personal genomes are, are coming in. The proteome, this is uh, all of the proteins that are expressed in your, in your cells. The transcriptome is thinking about all of the 
all of the transcripts, all of the messenger RNAs and regular R regulatory RNAs that are expressed. And there's actually uh, genetics and genomes were the big, big talk for a long time. Um, we're actually kind of transitioning back to a more cell-based, um, I don't know, environment now. Because it's been found, this, uh, this discipline called epigenetics is how the cell actually modifies its own genome. So we'll talk about how, how cells do this. But there are cases where the cell will actually shut down certain genes. And even though you're, you're carrying an allele that should give you a certain trait, the cells of your body will actually shut that down, and you won't express that trait. Or they'll modify the, the chromosome. There's even modifications of the mRNA. So you might be expressing a certain sequence in the mRNA, and the cell will actually go in and swap around nucleotides so it doesn't code for the same thing anymore, and you'll get a different protein. So reading your genome doesn't necessarily mean that's the sequence that your proteins are going to have. So there's kind of a return to the cell. Um, there's lots of people talking about self-assembly and, and natural genetic engineering, the cell actually engineering its own genome. So uh, I think this is a good thing. Uh, in fact, you are not your genes. And I think probably the most important things about you are not coded for in your genome. Um, there's a lot more going on in your body and in your cells than just DNA getting expressed. So we'll flush this out more as the semester goes on, but you are not your genes. Yeah? What was the major reason for them wanting to sequence the human, you know, always? Yeah, well, it was like, we're going to cure every genetic disease and every human disease because we're going to know everything there is to know about how cells and, and bodies function. It was a real genome genetic viewpoint. It said, if we know the sequence of genes, then we'll be able to do basically anything we want <laughs> in terms of curing diseases and predicting phenotypes and things like that. So I mean, there's curiosity on the one hand, but I mean, there's a reason why Craig Venter could get people to give him millions of dollars to sequence it, because there was a lot of money to be made in treating human diseases. So uh, it turns out that human diseases are not so simple as just finding one gene sequence. Uh, we found most of the single gene diseases. Um, a lot of diseases are regulation of things in the cell, multiple gene contributions, unknown reasons viral infections, um, you know, there's all kinds of things that you, you can't cure just by knowing the sequence of proteins, so, yeah. Which brings me to Francis Crick. Um, the whole genome era was based on what Francis Crick proposed, and he proposed this mechanism soon after um, he and Watson discovered uh, the structure of DNA. Uh, Watson went on to actually, or I'm sorry, Crick went on to actually uh, figure out how nucleic acid, how um, sequences of DNA actually coded for sequences of protein. So he solved the genetic code. Uh, and shortly after that, he proposed what he called the central dogma of molecular biology. He said, the really important thing is knowing your DNA sequence. The DNA is going to be made into messenger RNA. Messenger RNA is going to be made into protein. And proteins are what determine your phenotype. So this kind of came with it like this one gene, one trait kind of thing. If we can identify the DNA sequence, we can know what the trait is. So if you have a disease, all we have to do is find the DNA. We'll know what the protein is. We can cure it. In this model, DNA is, is little more than just a passive carrier of information. It doesn't do anything. It just sits there passively and, and holds the information. Uh, that in itself is an amazing thing, if you think of a chemical holding information. Most chemicals don't hold information. There's no information in methane. Even if you polymerized a bunch of carbons together and you make a big, long, fatty acid, there's no information there. I mean, maybe there's a repeating pattern that's information of a sort. It's called Shannon information, repeating patterns based on natural law. But genetic information, uh, real um, substantial coding information, things that tell you something, um, can't be based on natural law. Right? Uh, if the rule was a G always came after a C, always came after a T, then all you're going to get is a repeating pattern. Right? That's not going to give you any information. 
So the fact that a molecule can actually be rearranged in such a way so that it can hold information uh, is a really phenomenal thing. It's my philosophy that there is no way you can get information without somebody who has put the information in there. Um, people argue about that, and we'll talk about that a little bit more when we talk about DNA and intelligent design. Uh, but DNA itself in the molecular, uh, the central dogma is just a carrier of information, and it's proteins that really matter. Um, DNA going to RNA is transcription. RNA to protein is translation. And then you can also, you know, DNA replicates itself. Uh, we're going to poke holes in the central dogma a lot this semester uh, because this is way more to getting, tr uh, th this is, this is the basis of expressing a proteins, and proteins are necessary, but in terms of like all there is to know about expressing a trait, uh, there's way more than this. So I just introduced this as kind of like our post-genomic, post-genetic era. Th there's more to you than just expressing genes. So we'll talk about holes in this. All right, we'll stop there. Next time we'll talk about nucleotides and get into actual DNA structure. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.